The Philadelphia Eagles, like every team in the NFL, have had their share of setbacks. Beyond poor seasons and bad press, players, coaches, and fans have had to endure devastating personal tragedies. Eagles defensive tackle Jerome Brown was well regarded for his efforts on and off the field. In five years of professional football, he became an indispensable component of the team's defense, and he was commended for, among other acts of kindness, rescuing a trucker and helping residents of his hometown of Brooksville, Florida stand up to the Ku Klux Klan. Brown had spent the year leading up to June 1992 under the cloud of a minor scandal related to his drinking, but it hadn't dimmed his career. Then, he and his nephew took a Corvette from a Brooksville Chevrolet dealer for a test drive. When they came upon a slick patch of road, Brown lost control of the car. It flipped and crashed, killing both Brown and his nephew. Brown was only 27 at the time. His nephew was 12. Jerome Brown was a for real person. Somebody that cared more than a lot of people thought he did. Though Brown's tenure with the Eagles was relatively brief, his impact was considerable, and his fellow players struggled for years to recover from the loss. As Eric Allen told Sportsweek, it took us a long time to understand how to come back and try to fill that friendship void. That was like a brother, not a teammate. Randall Cunningham was described in a Bleacher Report headline as a one-man team. It became very apparent to us almost immediately that Randall was going to be fun to watch. It was jaw-dropping to watch him play. As quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, he never led the team to victory in the playoffs, and Eagles coach Buddy Ryan's focus on defense limited Randall's support and skill. He was dropped by the Eagles in 1995, but went on to a greatly improved performance with the Minnesota Vikings in 1998. Randall bopped between the Cowboys and Baltimore Ravens in 2000 to 2001, but officially retired as an Eagle a year later, although he didn't actually play for the franchise that year. In 2003, he took up a new calling, religion. After becoming an ordained minister, he established his own non-denominational church, Remnant Ministries, in Las Vegas. The Twin Cities Pioneer Press reported that the chaplain for the Vikings in the 1990s played a large role in Randall's spiritual journey, and Randall himself was chaplain for the Las Vegas Raiders for two years. As a minister, Randall Cunningham sometimes used a hot tub at his home to perform baptisms. On June 29, 2010, while he was away, one of his children, Christian Cunningham, was found in the tub. He was given CPR and taken to the hospital, but it was too late. At only two years old, Christian died by accidental drowning. Andy Reid endured plenty of rebukes while part of the Philadelphia Eagles organization, but he skillfully guided a succession of quarterbacks to impressive seasons during his 14 years as head coach. Closer to home, Andy faced challenges with his son, Garrett Reid, who had a long-standing issue with heroin addiction. He was arrested in 2007 after causing a car crash while under the influence, and he sold drugs in poorer neighborhoods for a time. Garrett made efforts to curb his addiction and worked for the Eagles as an unofficial camp assistant. But in 2012, Garrett died of an accidental heroin overdose. Andy Reid's oldest son, Garrett, was found dead in his room at Lehigh University where the Eagles hold their training camp. His family issued a statement through the Eagles commending his efforts to end his drug use and offering support to families in comparable situations. Andy's younger son, Britt Reed, has also struggled with drug use. He was arrested the same year as his brother and was later involved in a 2021 car crash that severely injured a young girl. By that time, Andy Reed had left the Eagles to become head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs. In 2006, 44-year-old Andre Waters was found dead by his girlfriend in his home in Tampa, Florida. The death was ruled a suicide. Waters was a Florida native who'd come to Pennsylvania to attend Cheney University. He signed with the Philadelphia Eagles in 1984 and played with them for nearly 10 years, earning a reputation for his aggressive tackles. He could take on anybody because he had such a big heart for playing the game. He briefly played for the Arizona Cardinals after leaving the Eagles before becoming an assistant coach at Fort Valley State University. Waters suffered numerous injuries during his time as a player. Before his death, his family reported increasing signs of depression. After his death, an examination of Waters' brain tissue showed damage comparable to an elderly man in the early stages of Alzheimer's. Neuropathologist Dr. Bennett Omalu speculated that the hits Waters took on the field were either directly responsible for his brain damage or a significant contributor. Players are at a very high risk because they take, studies show, about a thousand hits to the head each fall. 
Omalu's investigation was the subject of a 2015 film, Concussion, starring Will Smith as Omalu and Richard T. Jones as Waters. Many of Waters' friends and relatives were upset by the portrayal of him in the film. Particularly upsetting was a fictional encounter between Waters and Chicago Bears player Dave Dewerson, in which the two argued, with Waters later shooting himself as a result. Guy Morris was with the Philadelphia Eagles for a decade, from 1973 to 1983. He was an offensive lineman for the team who recruited him after college. His enthusiasm and commitment to football were all-consuming. Well before it became standard practice, he worked on his fitness even in the off-season, and he played and practiced through serious injuries. After one particular season, he needed surgery on both shoulders. But Morris is quoted on the Eagles' website explaining, if I wasn't on the field, somebody else was in my spot, and the coaches may decide they like him a little bit better than they did old guy Morris. I just wasn't going to let that happen. Morris became a coach himself after leaving the Eagles, with a stint playing for the New England Patriots in between. I mean, Coach Morris was a guy that done the drills with us. He was a guy that ran the conditioning tests with us. In fact, he coached longer than he played leading teams in high school, college, and the NFL over 30 years. In 2017, he revealed he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which doctors connected to his football career. Morris used therapy and the drug Aricept to fight the disease in its early stages, but accepted that it was incurable. He died in 2022. After Wes Hopkins' death in 2018, sports writer Ray Dittinger shared a memory of him recalling the fear and disappointment shown by the Arizona Cardinals when they learned that Hopkins had the okay to play against them. As defensive back, Hopkins was one of the most effective and aggressive players for the Eagles in his 10 years with the team. His Sports Illustrated obituary noted that he ranked third in games played by Eagles defensive backs and was part of the celebrated Gang Green defense of 1991. Five years earlier, a severe knee injury had left him on the sidelines for an entire season, but he came back strong in 1988. Hopkins retired in 1993, but maintained the friendships he made in his active years. One of them, Harvey Armstrong, noted that Hopkins was in failing health for some time before his death at 57. Armstrong compared Hopkins' state of mind in his final years to another former Eagle, Andre Waters. Armstrong told the Philadelphia Inquirer, you could see some of the things he was dealing with, the depression and the anxiety. Armstrong believed Hopkins suffered from chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a degenerative brain condition common among former NFL players. But his cause of death and whether or not Hopkins suffered from CTE were never made public. Chuck Hughes first made a name for himself in college football at Texas Western. The Philadelphia Eagles recruited him in 1967, but he saw little playing time. In 1970, he was traded to the Detroit Lions. Hughes was a good sport about his limited use and was popular with his teammates. In 1971, he was injured in a preseason game, but an examination found no serious issues and he continued to play. In an October 24th game against the Chicago Bears, Hughes was put in as a sub for wide receiver Larry Walton. Hughes made an impressive catch, but with less than a minute left in the game, he collapsed on the field and died shortly after of a blood clot in an artery. Back in those days, ambulances were not standard at NFL games. That change was made after Hughes passed away. An autopsy confirmed that Hughes suffered from arteriosclerosis, a hardening of the arterial wall. The coroner made no direct link between Hughes playing and his fatal heart attack and put no blame on doctors who hadn't caught the condition. Its signs are difficult to detect, but he did say that, had the disease been detected in previous checkups, Hughes should have been advised to retire. Hughes is the only known football player to die on the field. Kevin Turner started his football career with the New England Patriots before being traded to Philadelphia. He spent five years with the Eagles as a fullback, retiring in 1999. You often hear coaches say, put your head in there, son. I was the best <laughs> at that. In 2010, at age 41, Turner was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, more widely known as Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. A degenerative condition affecting nerve cells in the brain and spine, ALS is currently incurable. When first diagnosed, Turner was given 12 to 15 years to live, but by 2014, his condition had deteriorated to the point where he struggled to breathe on his own, 
and he ultimately required a tracheostomy and a feeding tube. When a group of former players filed a suit against the NFL over damage caused by concussions, Turner was a featured plaintiff. He told ESPN, Football had something to do with my having ALS. I don't know to what extent, and I may not ever know, but there are too many people I know that have ALS and played football in similar positions. Turner was still advocating on behalf of fellow ALS patients and former players when he died in 2016 at 46. John Dorenbos grew up under a cloud of tragedy. His father killed his mother when Dorenbos was only 12. His two favorite escapes from a difficult upbringing were magic tricks and football. The latter became a career, and he landed with the Philadelphia Eagles in 2006. He was with them as a long snapper for 11 seasons and was widely embraced by fans of the game. But in 2016, a shift in strategy left Dorenbos frequently on the sidelines. To the surprise of many, but not himself, he was traded to the New Orleans Saints. No sooner had Dorenbos relocated that he learned his football career was over. I was told that had I played that Monday night and got hit in the chest, you know, the chances of me dying were higher than living. Ahead of the 2017 season, it was discovered that he had an aortic aneurysm. He was placed on the non-football injury list and headed into surgery. The operation was successful, but it meant that Dorenbos's days playing football were numbered. In 2016, while still with the Eagles, Dorenbos competed on America's Got Talent with his magic act, winning third place. He transitioned relatively seamlessly into a second career as a magician. When the Eagles competed in the Super Bowl in 2018, team owner Jeffrey Lurie arranged for Dorenbos to see the game live. And when the Eagles won that year, Dorenbos received a championship ring.